Folks, I've got with me a very interesting uh, lady of multi-talents. Her name is, and, and correct me because I've been trying to spell it properly or say it properly, it's Ndidi Onokulu? Yeah, Ndidi Onokulu, <laughs> that is me. But I just go by Ndidi O because uh, it's easier. <laughs> it's easier. Well, it's also your moniker based on what I've yes. been able to actually see uh, across the uh, internet and with uh, reviews and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, you've got how many years of experience? Because I know you started very young. Ooh. Yes, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have six albums uh -huh. thus far. This newest one is my sixth. And yes, I've been for almost 20 years. 2006 was when my first album was released for 2024. So 18 years at this point. <laughs> I'm going to be 20 soon. <laughs> God willing. Um, but you don't you don't show your age because you're about ten years younger than I am. Okay. Give or take. And I'm cresting towards fifty, so <laughs> um, Well thank you. <laughs> uh, so um I understand that you were born in BC. Mm -hmm. Uh uh and then maybe a year or uh, two thousand sixteen, I think you went down to New York City to do the open mics and that's where yes. that's where you decided to actually become enamored with some of the blues and some of the stylings that you were getting from that location yes it was actually way earlier than that so i went to new york in the late 90s and when i was there i was going to open mics it was a very wild time i had already decided before that i was a blues singer i decided i was a blues singer songwriter probably when I was very young. I heard uh, John Lee Hooker. I got a John Lee Hooker cassette tape and I listened to it. And there was something about it that, something about the tone of his voice that when I heard it, I was like, I'm going to just sing like that because it just felt so rooted to the earth. And he was just singing with such truth and depth. And I thought to myself, that's the kind of voice I want to develop. So that's when I decided the blues is what I was going to do and so then I went to New York with that intention of becoming a blues singer but New York was crazy and too much for me and my very good friend came down and was like saw that I was straying very far away from the plan that I'd made for myself and she's like you know what let's just go to Toronto let's try just come on back home like let's just go back to Canada you're just a mess here and I was like okay so we went back to Toronto and that's actually where my career started it took a while but I got there yeah, well, the Massey Hall was one of your spots that you actually uh, attended yes. and performed, which is a uh, big um, marker of style and sass when it comes to I, blues. Oh, it's, it's, I agree. I mean, it's really, I was very, very, very blessed. I had a friend that worked for the Toronto Blues Society, and they used to do a kind of competition where you could submit demos and, you know, they would maybe discover you. And so I'd made these demos and I gave them to my best friend to give to our mutual friend that worked at the Toronto Blues Society. Mm -hmm. And she gave it to him a little bit late. <laughs> so I missed the actual competition, but he was playing the songs in the office and the head of the society heard them and was like, who's that? And then contacted me. So I have really Derek Andrews from the Maple Blues Society to thank for starting my career. If it wasn't for him, he immediately connected me with Madagascar Slim. He just got me in front of a lot of the right people and enabled me to just have a career. So I'm very, very grateful for him and the Toronto Blues Society. Uh, They're gonna... the reason why I've, I have a career. Yeah. Them, and the C them and the CBC are the two reasons <laughs> why I was able to have a career. Uh, speaking of which, folks, if you uh, are members of the Toronto Blues Society, there's a, a natural... Um, I want to say journal, but it's not a journal. It's, a, it's kind of a pamphlet made yeah. into a small magazine mm -hmm. um many pages but uh, uh you are on march's uh magazines which it's it's, it's even fun because we get to see you um if you want to know a little bit more about uh ndido well, it's easy you just need to follow this video and i'll make sure that you guys can actually go see her professionally made web page uh, which has a bunch of links she also has a wikipedia which is kind of fun 
<laughs> it's pretty funny. My niece is amazing and she updates it for me. So oh, I love these today's kids. They are amazing and they're so tech savvy. I was like, can you fix something? She's like, absolutely. And just figured it out. Stuff that I've been laboring over, struggling to understand. She just did it. She's 10 and she just did it in two minutes. I just love this kid so much. So she's my um, social media and uh <laughs> online profile manager my oh, okay. 10 year old niece she's the absolute best oh she must love <laughs> you um there there is one thing that i need to point out to people uh, you are a singer songwriter yes uh you have been nominated twice for junos uh you won uh a maple blues award i think it was in 2016 yes. uh no Probably way earlier than that, 2007. Yeah, it was I for thought. Best Blues... Uh, New Artists. Exactly. Yes. And, and then I won the WCMA Western Canadian Music Award um, for Blues Artist of the Year in 2019. So, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yes. All my accolades. Oh. And now her newest accolade is a uh, beautifully made CD, 11 minutes, uh, 11 songs at 40 minutes in total. But you get lost with the songs very much. Um, one, two that I actually like is uh, The Working Girl and uh, Too Late, which yeah. has a kind of a tongue-in-cheek type of feel. Yeah. Uh, the song, the song, the album is entitled Songs for Complicated Times. Yes, simple songs for complicated times. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Uh, did you compose this during COVID? Yes, it was a combination of during COVID and after COVID. COVID was a very wild time. I was in the United States at that time, so it was even crazier. Like in Canada, at least, there were some things happening that made it a little less rough down there. It was absolute chaos, <laughs> and I survived it, but I also had a stroke, and it was just like... Like, there was a lot of things that happened. I didn't get COVID during the COVID height. It's still, COVID is still happening. Let's be real. It's still a thing that exists and is infecting people. Yeah. But I, during the big concentration of it, I managed to not get it. Um, but I did have a stroke, which made me really think about my mortality a lot more, which is why songs like Too Late, I wrote after that. And worse, you know, oh, wow. I wrote after that, you know, songs thinking about what it is to be a woman of, you know, a certain age in the middle age range and just feeling like it's different now. What I create now is in the last half of my life. So I think I, when I wrote this album, I was very intentional about it. This is the first album out of all six where I was intentional about what I was trying to say and how I was trying to say it. And the songs, the track listing, like how they're ordered is very intentional. Everything is very intentional. This is my song, my album for the perimenopausal woman, for the woman that's in this wild, weird space where you're not, I can't really rely on my physicality to promote my career which is what a lot of women are unfortunately forced to do in the music industry there is a level of our physicality that we have to well that is encouraged to be presented before our craft there's you know outfits and things and you know you know exposing ourselves in ways that male artists do not have to do but when you reach a certain age it's like i'm not going to do that anymore i don't i'm not hot like that you know i don't i'm not young i don't have the sheen of new of innocence i've lived a life i've lived many lives i have many experiences and i've made many different choices you know especially with you know that weird uh what was it the football guy that made that crazy speech that's all over the internet that people were like ah and there's this whole very <laughs> wild christian evangelical right-wing push for women to be homesteaders and like you're most of you're the value of women is being sort of crush and become about how many children you can have and what kind of wife you can be and I made very different choices because I don't believe that that is the only purpose of women like I don't believe that's the only purpose of any being is to be one thing or the other we have many gifts to give to this earth we have many communities to build in many ways we can support and a woman's uterus shouldn't be her value and when you hit this sort of perimenopausal menopausal world your uterus is no longer of value so what does that look like? And a lot of women in this world, we, we start to become invisible. We become very invisible. And I was really recognizing that. I was like, oh, this is where invisibility starts. What can I do with it? 
And so it's, it's very freeing in one hand because I literally don't care about anything. I'm like, whatever, you can't see me anyways, doesn't matter. <laughs> but I also know that I have more power because I've lived more and I'm becoming more of the woman I've always wanted to be. I'm surprised that you survived COVID with a stroke. I'm just surprised that you lived through your stroke without too oh, many issues. Oh, it was issues. extremely minor. It was one of these very strange things where it was happening and I knew it was happening, but I was volunteering at the time and I was with some other volunteers and I looked at one and I said, I think I'm having a stroke and she immediately called 911 and I heard a voice in my head. So I've had a death experience before where I would my heart stopped, but I came back to life. This is many, many years ago. Okay. And when I was, <laughs> this is wild, what a weird interview. But anyways, <laughs> so when I was in, I guess, bed, my brain didn't totally die. So I wasn't fully dead, but my heart did stop for a little bit. And they were defibrillating or whatever. So before, I guess I came back into my body, I just remember there was a voice that said no. And it was like, I, where I was going somewhere, my soul, my conscience, whatever, exists when we leave these houses i was going to wherever was next mm. i knew this much and i thought and i wanted i wanted to go there it was like great wherever that was i was like amazing i can't wait i'm so excited and it was like no i heard this voice say no and i was pushed back into my body and i was like i regained regain consciousness and was like oh i'm back here this sucks and so <laughs> but anyways this is a long time, time ago, ago okay. and so when the stroke happened i heard that exact same voice say to me you're not gonna die this doesn't kill you and so i was very much like okay and by the time i got to the hospital all of the stroke signs were done and i was fine and okay. I've been fine ever since. So you know, there's things I modify and I watch my stress levels and I watch my, I do a lot of work to lower my inflammation and blah, 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 blah. But mm. no, I'm fine. It was very, it was very minor. It lasted like five minutes. Well, I'm glad that you're still here. Otherwise, we, th this would be a weird interview. I'm talking to <laughs> exactly. Didi. This album wouldn't exist. And this is my best album today. So I'm very glad I lived too. I mean, it just also gave me a little more appreciation, A, for life and more admiration for my body and gratitude to whatever that voice is and whatever plane of existence that energy lives because it's very powerful to hear in your head while you're in the midst of like a weird health crisis some but something say, saying to you you're going to be okay don't uh, worry this, have, this doesn't kill you <laughs> i have to thank you by the way for this because uh you, it's 11 30 in ireland right now for her yes <laughs> where it's right. 7 30 ish well 7 45 actually right now here in the maritimes uh, so uh, the album itself uh, did you have anyone slotted to actually participate in helping you do the musical creation of it or was it um yes i worked with an amazing producer and one of my best friends misha chillak and steve dawson oh, who yeah. is the producer for the album i went we had a pre-production session where we played like i had done the demos and i brought them to him and we worked them out and then we brought the musicians in and everybody sort of played live off the floor they heard the demos and we just did it but yes, I have Steve Dawson to thank a lot for his guidance and his ability to put together just an amazing group of players. Like, I absolutely love working with him. He's one of my favorite human beings and one of my favorite musicians. So it was a very beautiful experience. <laughs> but yes, uh, and I worked with Steve Mariner, co-wrote Too Late with me, and Tara Lightfoot, who is, I just love her, and she's amazing. And she worked on, uh, co-wrote the song Grief with me. And so, you know, I had, I called in some people that I've had the pleasure of getting to play with who I admired and was like, would you want to work on this with me? And they're like, absolutely. And so it was really nice because I normally, the earlier records was a lot of me by myself with maybe one other person. And it was just a lot of like, ah, torture. But this time I was like, I'm going to just see who else would be want down to write with me. Like, I don't know. And I was pleasantly surprised to know that there were people that were willing to do that and okay. took the time to create great songs. So it was good. So when you do uh, singing song, uh, well, say, not singing songwriting, <laughs> do <laughs> you do you use any musical instruments to help you through your own journey? Yes, I uh, use the guitar, piano sometimes, but primarily guitar and voice. So I usually start with. Um, I often sometimes just start with this story like what I want to say so I'll write a bunch of lyrics I'm very fast at lyric writing so I'll write things really quick and then I 
start to sing them and melodies will come and I'll sing out the melody and then I'll get a guitar and start playing random chords and random notes and I build it that way and do really rough demos but I do write primarily with voice and guitar okay um, now um, other than being a fabulous singer songwriter and fabulous blues woman who's Canadian by the way <laughs> um As a human being, separating the music part of your soul to your uh, little girl slash big woman uh, soul, uh, do you have any pastimes that you actually love to dabble in? Yes, I absolutely. I love to screenwrite. I write a lot of random screenplays. I have these worlds in my head and I'm trying to write mystery novels, like short stories, mystery short stories. I'm starting with short stories because the novel, I tried to start a novel and cried and it was a very difficult experience, but I like to write stories. I also like to feed crows and do a lot of cat rescue, particularly feral cat rescue and work with animals. Um, I guess those are my hobbies, reading. I read a lot. I write a lot, a lot of random stories and essays and work with animals, vulnerable creatures. And I volunteer with kids, youth in, youth in care. I am a big advocate for youth in the foster care system. And Wow. Okay, that, that's a I, lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess I, I have a very active mind. I have ADHD. So if I don't have some kind of random project that I've got to get into, I will just get depressed. So Ooh. I have a lot of things happening. <laughs> at all times well that, that's kind of good as long as it doesn't push you over your your physical limits and oh no 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 never yeah. i mean i i believe that as a human being i i do truly believe that our jobs as human beings is to care for each other and to build community and make sure we all have what we need to live a life of of joy and unfortunately i'm existing under late stage capitalistic insane <laughs> wild it's a wild world it's a very hard world so if there's any place that i see that i can be of service to help those that need my help i will it doesn't matter like if i will help anybody you know there there was a, a gentleman in when i was in vancouver that was having a mental breakdown in an and w it was a very like he was obviously a, a houseless youth and he was struggling with his mental health in this restaurant and it the person people working there were getting nervous and so they called the police and I was like well I don't think the police need to be involved so I just talked to him I said are you okay he said no I need to do this thing and I have he has he had a beautiful dog he's like I need somebody to watch my dog and nobody can watch them and I said I'll watch your dog he's like really I said absolutely and the police came and I you know made sure he was safe from the police because he was he just needed somebody to acknowledge him he was in distress and nobody would just take a moment talk to this person because we're so very afraid of somebody falling apart in front of us we're, we're so there's so much stigma around addiction and mental health and houselessness that we don't take the time to go this is a person this is a person that's obviously experienced a lot of trauma so how can i help in this situation and so any situation i see myself being of service i will be of service so i guess that's my hobby is being of service i don't know i just want to live in a world where we're all we all feel love and we all feel care and if i have the capacity to provide that that's my actual main operating point that's where i write my music from even it's mm. i do music because it's what i'm good at and i enjoy it I but it's, be it's becoming harder and harder as time goes on because of the landscape has changed so dramatically and It's unfortunate, but thankfully people like you and you know the CBC and other places really like honestly it's it's you guys that help us keep going and the people that come to support and come to the festivals and come to the shows and buy the albums, you know, go out of their way to like actually buy them through Apple Music or buy them through places, not just stream them. It's Yeah, good. Slow, but there are still I'm lucky that my audience is older, so in general they are very, very supportive. But it's You currently have hip hop in your life as well. I think you're one. At one point, you were. I don't know how old this is. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I had a, uh, I have a trip hop group, if you will. It's not hip hop. It's trip hop, and it's um, still active. We still make music. It's it's fun. It's a different form of expression. I always, I was a big fan of Portishead and Tricky and these acts when they were coming out. I thought what they were doing was so interesting, and so this is sort of 
something I do on the side because I love that type of music. There's a mood to it. It's very, it's still bluesy. It's still in this world. Yeah. You know, hip hop, hip hop comes from the blues. Rock and roll comes from the blues. Country music comes from the blues. Like all of these things come from that actual traditional sort of form of music. So I see it as an extension of that. Hmm. And it's just fun, you know, in that space, I don't have to be so mindful of anything. Oh, as long as you enjoy <laughs> it, that's the whole point of it. Now, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of questions that I can ask, but uh, I'm go I'm gonna go to the, la the a question that I've been asking everyone to make it fair, which is basically, what's your favorite food dish? Food dish. Yes. Ooh, oh, this is tough. This is very tough. I do love pizza. Does that count as a food dish? It does. I'm yeah. I I'm had that. To pizza, I, I, love it so I had one artist tell me ice cream. <laughs> okay, well, I would probably say cacio e pepe. Cacio that e pepe? pasta dish is probably what my favorite. It's probably my favorite. That oh. and pizza. It's Thai. It's Thai, but a cacio e pepe is so simple and it's so delicious, and I love it, and it makes me happy. So cacio e pepe. That's oh. probably my favorite right go. now, today, in this moment. Um. Yeah, as a songwriter, there is a question I uh, need to ask you. Uh, I've been trying to focus on this with other artists, but it's it's been when they're not doing songwriting and they're just musicians and mm -hmm. <laughs> sing, uh, it's kind of uh, different. Um, have you tried selling a song to someone, uh, creating it for their uh, possible uh, portfolio? Actually... I've been I've been in rooms I've done so that's called top lining when okay. you're writing for another artist and I've done top lining yes okay. when I was living in LA that's like a thing you do did anything I do ever sell to anybody no but I've been in rooms and like been in writers rooms and working on top lining but a lot of my um, a lot of music that I've made has been placed into television shows and films and oh, trailers nice. and so I've done a lot of sync writing which is kind of like top lining because it's to be sold to a tv show or to a commercial or to so i do a lot of that like i've done a lot of jingles i've i've done a lot of commercial writing and commercial vocals so it's yes but no i've not done i've not written nobody's been like indeed could you write a song for me specifically no but i have been in rooms where you know other people were Yeah, Orange is the New Black is one of them that I that was mentioned. Yep. And for Marvel folks, Cloak and Dagger was Cloak one and Dagger, yeah. And then a bunch of commercials that we won't uh, encourage because <laughs> it's capitalism. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you actually had that and that they grabbed on to you to actually uh, do two things. Boost their margins, but gave you a platform that... Didn't. A little bit. It did. It did help a little bit. It's not as. I mean, it helps mostly because it it pays relatively well, <laughs> so it's very helpful in that way. Because as musicians, it's very hard for us to earn enough to survive, especially with streaming currently. Yeah. Our our livelihood has been decimated. Touring is often a deficit situation. It's very very difficult these days. But. Um, So song placements really help. They allow you to survive. But because of that, it's become a much more concentrated field. So now there's like bands that are just for sync. That's all they do. And there's a lot of producers that that's all they do. They're writing just for sync. So it's become a bit more competitive and a bit more of a thing uh, now. But when I was starting to do it, it was less concentrated. But, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I still get some placements to this day. And that's nice. But it's a different it's a different world. I... Writing for other people is interesting. It's hard, but it can be fun if that artist you're writing for is actually involved in the process. But when you're doing pop top lining, they're not around. They, you're just one of like, no, literally, you're just in a room writing. You kind of know who the artist is, so you know their vibe, and you write kind of based on what their vibe is. It's like, you know, when people are hearing Beyonce songs, Rihanna songs, there are writers camps. So there are specific writers that they know that they always bring into, they bring them into houses, and they live together, and they just write oh, wow. every day. And then they send them to the artist, and she goes, okay, yes, no, yes, 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 whatever. And so it's, it's, it's a little less personal so i think if there was a 
a time where an artist wanted to work with me and wanted me to co-write with them or write something for them, yeah. I would love for them to be involved just so I could hear what it is that they, they want. What are they trying to say? What are they feeling? Let me tap into that because it can be a little impersonal. And what I find important, like nobody listens to lyrics anymore. Unfortunately, I wish they did. But what I, I love about the word is that it, it's how we express ourselves. It's how we communicate so if we're going to, if I'm going to write a song for you, not only are you going to use the vibrational tones that is the vocal cords and make sound, you're going to use, you're going to say these words to tell a story. And why don't you tell a story that means something? Because I think we need in this world, in terms of art, art that means something, where people are saying something that means something to them and is rooted in a truth, an emotional truth. Because when you create something that's coming from a place of truth and from your heart, it will resonate with other people. Because they'll, they will have, we've all, we all experience the same things. We really do. Men and women, children, we all experience the same things when it comes to emotions. We all, we all experience the same sort of weird things on this planet. We're, we're not disconnected in any way. We're all very connected. So I find when artists really stand in their truth and really tell their truth, it's very powerful and beautiful. And so when writing specifically for somebody else, unless you know them well, it can be kind of a weird process, <laughs> imper impersonal and feels very silly. So uh, when you did your top lining, um, I'm assuming that you're submitting it to a publishing house for a possible turnaround? No, in those cases, you submit it to the artist's manager and they play it for the artist. Okay. Top lining is, a, is like when you're writing for a specific pop artist. So it's through their managers and through their producers. And I've not done it often. I've just like been in other people's top lining sessions and helped out. But I wasn't like the main writer in that because there's usually like four or five writers. You're not, it's not just one person writing for one person. No, no, no. There's like five or six people all writing. It's a whole thing. It's a yeah. whole weird, it's a weird world. I didn't love it, so I didn't do it very often. So uh, coming back to uh, the ending point of your current tour, you're, you're in Ireland right now, basically mm -hmm. touring bits and pieces. Uh, but when are you back in Canada? I will be playing the Vancouver Folk Festival in July 19th, 20th, and 21st. My main stage is the 20th. I will be there a lot that day singing the songs from this new album. And it's going to be great. I'm very excited. And that's sort of my only show for the rest of the year. And then there's a Alberta, BC tour happening in April of next year. And there'll be more next year. But because I released this album in the spring, yeah. most of the festivals have already booked. True. So, you know, they're not going to throw you in. Like, they already have their lineups. They're already starting their promotion. They're already figuring out their marketing. So, it because of my timing, I kind of missed out on this year's kind of season. But next year will be better. Okay. Well, folks. I, ho I hope to get to the Maritimes. There's so many festivals out there I would love to play. I've only ever played one festival in the Maritimes. It was in Wolfville, yeah, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, the uh, Smoky Mountain Rock Festival, I think they call it now. Oh, it was like a blues folk thing when I was well, there. And it was on. It was amazing. It was so long ago, but I absolutely loved it. I've been trying to get back to the Maritimes for years, like a decade at this point. I just, I don't know how to do it, but I really want to go back there. I absolutely love it there. Plan the trip. <laughs> yeah. Literally. I'll just plan it. I'll be like, hey, I'm here. I'm just bring my band and we'll just show up and randomly play in some pubs. I'd be fine with that. I absolutely love the Maritimes. No, I'm a big, 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 big fan. Big, I'm, big fan. I'm happy you love it. Steve Mariner and his chums usually come down to Nova Scotia once in a while to visit some friends. Um, yes. So, uh, folks, this was the interview between me and Fabulous and DDO. Um, best of luck for your current tour and hopefully nothing bad will happen uh, I hope not too but hopefully I will see you in the Maritimes <laughs> next year sometime <laughs> that's my plan we'll wait and if, if, I, once I, if I hear something coming through the streams I'll be the first to start shouting about she's coming <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm working on it. I have a list of festivals that I've been scoping out. Every time I see something new popping out in the Maritime somewhere, I'm like, write it down. And I'm like, who do I need to talk to? And I've got a, I'm getting over there. I'm going to be there. Okay. I'm going to be there at some point in time. Well, I cannot wait. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you for listening and for wanting to chat. I always love talking and I appreciate the support very, very, very much.